hand it over to Andrea from Interface. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining Caroline. us. Thanks, Caroline. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us. We're so pleased to spend this time with you all. My name is Andrea Rojas. I'm an account executive at Interface, and I'm joined by our technical director of sustainability, Mikhail Davis. At Interface, our core business is developing sound flooring solutions, but our fundamental belief is that we can achieve this while being mindful of our planet by using circularity in our manufacturing processes. Since the early 90s, we've been on a journey to reduce our carbon footprint and consider ourselves a mission-led company. My role as an account executive is to guide the flooring making decision process to ensure our clients understand the impact of their investment. After all, flooring is one of the only finishes that touches every square foot of an interior fit out, this giving us a huge opportunity to prioritize low carbon, all while building beautiful and well-performing spaces. The good news is more are asking for carbon smart finishes and looking for transparency. More is good, but we need to get to all. With that said, Mikhail will dive deeper into our sustainability journey and provide insight into the transparency tools specifiers and manufacturers can use to measure and compare embodied carbon with respect to finishes. We hope that by sharing our journey, we inspire others to join us on this mission. With that, I give you Mikhail Davis. I have to unmute, but hello everyone, hello. BC CLF, thank you for being a member of this important community. And um, we're very happy to have been working for the last while with CLF as one of our, our core groups in terms of shaping the market, in terms of bringing this whole conversation on embodied carbon to the fore. You know, and we'll talk a bit about that today, about what we've been, been working on both as a manufacturer, but also as you know, part of this larger CLF community um, trying to to bring about change within building materials and within the building industry at large. Um, so I will share my screen, get this party started. Um, sound. It's like we still have people arriving, so welcome. So today we re I really hope to, we are probably, we're, you will see not a typical manufacturer, but I think that our story can really give you a sense of what it is possible to achieve sitting where we sit as a manufacturer in this larger architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Uh, you know, what could you ideally expect from manufacturers and what role could we play if we decide to lead as Andrea talked about, because that really has been you know, it was a simple when we suddenly discovered, you know, the environment in, in 1994, after being in business for 21 years, um, we realized how big the problems were and realized that we were contributing to them every day we were in business. And it was sobering, especially for our, our founder, Ray Anderson, who, for whom the company was uh, like a third child. He had put his life savings into this and 21 years of work and found that his, uh, his child had been misbehaving, but most businesses were, uh, but he wanted to create a new kind of business, a kind of business that we could all be proud of and that would leave a positive legacy as opposed to the negative legacy that he had just so belatedly discovered that his company was having in terms of all our products ending up at landfill, putting a huge amount of carbon in the atmosphere, polluting water, polluting air, et cetera. So, Today is a lot about our journey, but really about the larger opportunity for all of us to find a better way to do this, to find a better way to make building materials, find a better way to interact with our climate system. As you might know, we're in a bit of a situation with the climate. You know, we, we, I like this graph because this goes back 800,000 years. And you see there's lots of variation in the concentration of these heat trapping greenhouse gases in in the environment, but they never go above a certain level until you see something really unusual happen in the last you know, 50 to 100 years is that we are off the edge of the map. If you look at the variation for those 800,000 years, that's a certain zone of variation where life thrives. 
we are tipping over into an area where we don't really know how life is going to do with the atmosphere trapping that much heat. And so we are, are in a situation where um, humanity has never been before. And we are, are challenged by all of us who care uh, to come up with new solutions we've never had to come up with before. Now, the only other bit of climate science I will introduce here is that if you ask from a public health perspective, because we could think about this as sort of a, an eco ecological situation or an environmental situation, but it really is also a public health situation. This is from the, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where you see the stuff in the middle that we think of as climate change, rising temperatures, increasing CO2 levels in the atmosphere, rising sea levels, more extreme weather events. But those radiate out into stuff that we would all recognize as public health problems. You know, increased asthma and cardiovascular disease, increased spread of insect-borne illnesses, increased respiratory allergies, um, greater water quality issues in terms of contamination in water, uh, malnutrition. These are all serious public health issues. So if you Google greatest threat to public health in the 21st century, the answer is climate change, whether you're getting that out of the UK or Canada or US, World Health Organization, because it magnifies all of these other public health challenges. Air pollution, average higher temperatures are gonna make that worse. Um, you know, all of these things are magnified. And so this is at the level of public health and something that everyone can understand. Everyone knows someone with allergies or who has a disease that used to be rare that isn't maybe born by mosquitoes or ticks. Uh, I know my mother had Lyme disease. This is where we actually start to be able to explain the personal impact of climate change. It's not just this big system stuff that we can't wrap our heads around. But what if we took on this challenge, this never before seen human challenge as a design challenge? We accidentally changed the climate. We accidentally changed the composition of the atmosphere. We were just trying to design buildings and transportation systems and a global economy um, and to have cool stuff and the side effect of that, because of the way we did it, by taking all this old carbon that was safely stored underground and putting it into the atmosphere in the form of oil and gas and coal, we had this side effect. It was not a design decision. We didn't decide, hey, you know, what would be really great is if we explored what it'd be like to have, you know, 450 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and trap a bunch more heat than has ever been trapped before. Let's do it. No one decided to do that. That was not a design decision. But we do know that we have the power to change something on earth as fundamental as the climate system. So what if we actually designed a climate we want, a climate that we know works, a climate fit for life? And so that is really, you know, the challenge that we put out as part of our climate take back mission, which is to have the world take on this climate challenge, to, to bring our design and engineering brilliance to this challenge intentionally, rather than just get this you know, hope it works out to have a, a, an atmosphere that we don't know works for life on Earth. Um, never done that before. And the first thing that is required to do this is to really pay attention to our mindset. There's no great design that comes out of a mindset of denial of the problem you're trying to solve with your design or that comes out of being fundamentally frightened or depressed about it. We have to be able to cultivate an attitude intentionally of courage, action, positivity, belief. We put a lot of words on this page, but you know what I'm saying? Um, because that is what is gonna have us come up with the, the creativity uh, and the design brilliance we need to solve this problem. I love to find an excuse to use this slide in any presentation I can, but this is where we're, where we're at with, with the climate. We have a very good idea of how the problem starts, what's the equation, where are we now? We have a pretty good idea of where we'd like to be. We kind of know the composition of the atmosphere that works um, for the last 800,000 years. Somewhere in the middle, we got to design a miracle. Now, this is either an equation that proves that what we're trying to do is impossible. That's one mindset. Again, going back to mindset being very important. Or this is an equation that shows us that we are in a time when it is our job to generate miracles. And that's kind of a pretty cool way to live. So mindset, 
very important, either impossible or kind of wildly exciting and thrilling. It's all about mindset. So the cool thing is that what we're talking about here is entirely possible. Experts agree we distilled this down into a four-part plan, uh, but it's really just a lot of science behind this. If we want to get to that, that part of the equation that we, we know works where we want to get on the lower right there, we need to put less carbon in the atmosphere. We need to live zero, as, as, as close to zero fossil carbon going into the atmosphere as possible. Love carbon, that's kind of our funny way to say that we need to, to, to learn how to work with the carbon that's in the atmosphere and pull some of that carbon in the atmosphere out of it, just like a tree would do, and build something cool with it. We might build a building, tree's gonna build bark and leaves and blossoms and whatever else. Uh, we need to learn that trick. Uh, let nature cool is the third pillar of climate take back, which is really about the fact that nature already knows, as the tree does, how to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and build cool things with it. So let's not disturb nature's ability to do that. Do that. And in fact, maybe we can enhance with how we design and how we do landscapes and how we do planning, nature's ability to help us cool the climate back to a composition that we know works. And then finally, lead the industrial re-revolution. Uh, the amount of change that is needed in our economic systems and, and other systems to make it more profitable to reverse global warming than to cause it is nothing less than an industrial revolution. So we need to continually question our assumptions. So quickly, a little bit, a bit about me and interface by connection. Um, I'm the guy in the blue shirt in the middle there. Uh, that's me when I was 22 years old working with David Brower, who was one of the, the founders of the American environmental movement. Um, got a chance to be his personal assistant. And a funny thing happened to me in 1997, 98, I, met, I saw Ray Anderson give a talk, which was a bizarre experience. I'd never seen a, an environmental talk in a South Georgia accent. We learned all about the environment and other words I had never learned before. With, uh, so Ray Anderson's the guy next to me uh, in the black and white and the tie. Um, founder of Interface, but he was also the guy that read Paul Hawken, the guy at the far left, his book, The Ecology of Commerce, that showed him that he was on the wrong track, but also that his leadership was essential to get humanity onto the right track, that business needed to lead, and he was ready to step up to that challenge. Of course, he had no idea how to do it, so he went out and recruited Paul himself, who wrote that book, David Brower, uh, my mentor, but also Paul Hawken's mentor, uh, to say, I'm coming to you as a CEO of a big company and I want you to tell me how to transform my company. And they all said, yes, because no one had, no CEO had ever asked them to do that before. Um, so yeah, we all looked a little different back then. Um, I used to have hair. There's me when I joined Interface. I joined Interface in 2011 after, after years of doing other sustainability work, including consulting with other companies. Uh, again, I still had some hair back then. My kids looked a lot different than they do now. Uh, there they are now, shaggy adolescent monkeys that they are. I am not coming to you today from, uh, <laughs> I'm coming to you today from Uber headquarters in San Francisco where I forgot that I had another meeting. Um, but that is normally the little cottage office that I would be coming to you from in the backyard. There's my dog, there's my wife, my secret weapons there, the dog. Um, yeah, she looks familiar it's because she is the one, really the smart one in the family. You know, Mr. Peabody, it's kind of like that at our house. Um, she taught school during the pandemic. Now we tried, but she wouldn't, no matter how many treats we gave her, she wouldn't. Um, but coming back to, to Ray, this is, you know, Ray passed away the year that I joined Interface in 2011, but he really was the, the source of inspiration. And the reason I worked at Interface because he saw the bigger picture for business. It wasn't about just making great flooring or making stuff. It was about having, having a purpose worth coming to work for every day. So Ray liked to say, for those who, who think business exists to make a profit, I suggest they think again. Business makes a profit to exist. Surely it must exist for some higher, nobler purpose than that. And so that was the path he put us on was to have a purpose, uh, which was to, to transform industry's relationship to the environment. And then more specifically, we've defined that to be industry's relationship to the climate. So fun moment we had in 2021. Let's see if our, our sound is working. But of getting recognized in a very fun pop culture way on Jeopardy um, for our 
20 something years of work transforming industry. Helping the planet for 200. Georgia based carpet company Interface makes carpet tiles that are not merely this element neutral, they're negative. Andrea. What is carbon? That's it. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, the answer is what is carbon? Even better if we were to say what is embodied carbon, which is really, I have to say, our love language. That's one of the things we share with CLF. But really the journey that we've been on that took us to that moment where we got to be on Jeopardy and talking about having a carbon negative product um, has been a long time coming. And so I think you, you have a certain amount in it, and this is something for, for any manufacturers listening, you, you have a lot of people within your organization be like, oh, customers just aren't asking for that. All they care about is price and performance and aesthetics and acoustics and whatever else they care about in your product category. Um, but if you wait for them to care, um, you're missing the boat. You're missing this really amazing path toward, you know, showing your company and your employees a higher purpose, showing that you really can make a difference, a positive difference with how you run a manufacturing company. So this has kind of been our journey. You look at, you know, over in 1973 on, on the far right, Ray Anderson interface, does nothing on sustainability for the first 21 years, just trying to turn modular carpet into a thing. You know, and our, our mission, if we had one, was to, to you know, rid the, the world of, of broadloom carpet, uh, much uh, less ambitious mission than we took on in 1994, when Ray had what he called a spear in the chest moment, where he discovered kind of all the negative impacts of, you know, making plastic flooring. And so from then on, and then I met Ray in 97, that's a little arrow at the bottom, and then uh, got to go with, to see the interface facilities in Georgia in 1998. Um, so then I became an official Interface fanboy for subsequent years, but Interface goes on and introduces the first, you know, carbon neutral using offsets, um, you know, flooring in 2002, uh, lots of other innovations. One of important moment here is uh, in 2008, we introduced the first EPD in North America. Um, because we realized that if we wanted people to care about all the work we were doing to reduce our emissions, there had to be some way to keep the score. Everyone was starting to say, oh, well, we're green too. And we felt like we were much more serious about it and doing such a rigorous job measuring it. Um, but we wanted to figure out how would you get credit for that? How would we actually get past the greenwash and into keeping score? Looked at life cycle assessment, which we done internally and realized that what we really needed to, to get was a, some sort of a system where you could actually compare products externally using that life cycle assessment data. So if you wanted to know what the carbon footprint of your product was, there was a, gonna be a credible way to publish that. Um, and so we had to, along the way, invent a lot of standards uh, to make sure that we could be credible and this could be a, a truly, you know, engineering and science focused journey. So we published our first corporate sustainability report, but no one really had standards for how you reported on all the pollution your company put out. In fact, everyone thought we were crazy for doing that. Companies did not report the pollution and the bad news and the waste of their company back then. So this was a really radical thing in 1997. Now it's just called corporate sustainability reporting or CSR reporting. Uh, there was no standardized way to report how much emissions your company put into the atmosphere in terms of climate change. We had to help create the, the greenhouse gas protocol, which now everyone uses for their scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, our head of eco accounting is listed as a co-author in the original version of the greenhouse gas protocol. Great Canadian movie called The Corporation, which made which Ray Anderson kind of stole the show by calling out his own corporation and, and its evils. Uh, Time Magazine, Hero for the Environment. But here's what I was talking about, 2008, 2009, we published the first North American EPD, which of course for carpet tile. Um, and then by 2012, we had published EPDs for all of our products um, globally, including in places where nobody cared and nobody had ever knew what an EPD was. Um, we still don't in a lot of places in Asia, we're working on that. But then of course lead 2012 is also when you start to get the new version of lead come out, which references, references EPDs. And so then we get a lot of periods of people collecting EPDs for lead projects, um, but nobody's doing anything with them. So around about 2018, we decided we need to start a movement for people to actually use all this data um, called Materials Can, which we'll talk a bit about um, to keep score on embodied carbon. And then we need a tool, EC3, which we'll also talk about um, 
that can read the EPDs for you since still nobody wants to read the EPDs. They're very boring technical documents. And that's how we get on Jeopardy. Uh, but no, but before that, of course, we introduced the first carbon negative carbon tile backings and then some full products that are carbon negative for their cradle to gate life cycle. But it has been a journey. Uh, the good thing is we have created a path forward. There's actually a document that's about to come out and we can send it in a follow-up um, from building transparency uh, that we helped write called the Manufacturer's Guide to Embodied Carbon. So if you are a manufacturer who's just getting started on this journey, it doesn't need to take as long as ours. We've given you all of our best moves in this report and other ones that we've published um, so that you hopefully can make it up the mountain faster than we did. So <clears throat> back to zooming out to our industry here, because that's a little bit about my history and a little bit about interface history, but really where are we in the history of transforming the building sector, especially with regard to that 11% in this, this pie chart, you've probably seen some version of this before. That's our embodied carbon. That's the, the emissions that come from human activities that aren't, there's the 28%, which is running every building in the world using energy to do that putting out some emissions to do that. But then what about all the emissions required to make all of the steel, all the concrete, all the other materials that go into our materials. And then of course some on-site construction emissions. So most of you probably know this if you're on a CLF <laughs> webinar, but obviously we need to distinguish operational carbon. Lots of people have net zero goals for operational carbon, but aren't necessarily tackling their embodied carbon, which of course is from all that raw material extraction, transport, um, all of these things that have, that don't actually happen in the building, but they have happened on behalf of the building. They are the embodied emissions from that building. The important thing, the reason we really need to understand this is that we've been very focused. It's in building codes, it's in lead on that operational carbon, still very important work to do. But if you take in this with this graph from Architecture 2030 is global average building, not super efficient, not compared to what you get in the US or Canada. You can see the operational carbons are, are blue triangle and that goes up every year that you operate the building. We're starting in 2020, so we built it then, we put a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere for the materials, body carbon. Between 2020 and 2050, it's about 50-50 in terms of emissions from operations versus embodied carbon. But you can see that the closer we get to today, the more of that opportunity is actually embodied carbon. All of that carbon is in the atmosphere on day one before we even start running the MEP system in the building. We draw that, that red line, which I did on this chart, that's 2030, which is what the scientists say that any emissions we can re reduce before then are way more important than anything we reduce after it to make sure we don't go over this certain tipping point where a warming leads to more warming. So 2030 is super important. If we were to calculate this, it's about 75% of our opportunity from this building is in embodied carbon, not 50% between now and 2030. But to put that another way, the part we've been focused on, part of the iceberg that's above the water, just like in a real iceberg, is way smaller than the part of it we've not been focused on, that embodied carbon part. And I know some of you probably have been focused on this, but you're special and you're on a CLF webinar. But really the challenge that, that we're all working on is how do we do you make that iceberg visible and how do we shrink it? Uh, it's great to keep whittling away at the point of the iceberg. Of the iceberg. We need to keep reducing embodied carbon or operational carbon emissions. But the larger challenge and the more urgent challenge between now and 2030 is to take on this part that's been below water and is much larger, the embodied part. So of course you might know that the number one source, you know, be the <laughs> of embodied carbon is concrete. We just use so much of it. It's not that it's so much per unit necessarily, but we are in fact, you know, in layman's terms to make cement, which is really the part of concrete that's the problem. We are melting rock, which takes a lot of energy. Uh, also the, the, you know, the reaction that forms the, the cement also releases CO2, just so, so some chemistry in addition to all the, the energy using, that you're using. Um, you know, if, if concrete, were a country, it would be number three after the US and Canada in terms of global carbon emissions. So we are uh, <clears throat> emitting a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere to create all that concrete for our buildings. Um, anyone know what's number two? What's the number two source of embodied carbon emissions from buildings? Shout it out or put it in the chat. Um, 
by the way, I should have said, if you want to put questions in the chat at any time, please do. Um, I will stop and ask for questions at different times, but um, I have no problem talking for, <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say that since I get a little cryptic, um, but better if uh, you all participate. Steel, thank you, Alex Lau. <laughs> course it is steel. <clears throat> so again, our other big structural material, steel, like concrete, though, of course, there are, it's the number one source of embodied carbon, but there is, there are ways to reduce that. There are moves that we do. We can create, you know, concrete mixes that still work with less cement, maybe higher puzzling content. Um, there's, there's, you know, new technologies coming online to, to store CO2 um, from combustion in some of our concrete and cement. Um, similarly with steel, recycled steel, whenever we can use that, it's gonna have a far lower footprint than stuff where we have to account for the whole footprint of mining iron ore and whatever else we did to produce steel. Um, and then obviously the, the, the type of technology we use to produce that, are we using a basic oxygen furnace? We were burning a massive amount of something to make the steel, or are we using an electric arc reactor, which at least is a cleaner process and we could be, we aren't necessarily using renewable energy to power our electric arc reactor. But so it tends to be, you could look for steel made with an electric arc reactor and you'd know it would have lower embodied carbon. Now, does anyone know if we were to look just inside the building, if you're looking at the average TI, what's the per unit on average, number one source of embodied carbon on the inside of a building? This is the hard question. Concrete and steel are easy. But if you happen to have read the proper CLF reports, you might know the answer to this. <laughs> it is, of course, carpet. You're hearing from a company that sells a lot of carpet. And so you know, consider the source when you're thinking about what to guess. Carpet, uh, for a similar reason to, to steel or, or even more apt aluminum, um, it's because not all plastics have the same footprint. Not all metals have the same footprint. Aluminum has one of the highest footprints of any metal because of the process of taking it from crumbly red earth, bauxite ore into shiny lightweight metal requires a vast amount of energy and thus emissions. Uh, similarly, turning crude oil into an engineering plastic like nylon, which can replace metal in a structure or stand up to daily wear in a commercial space, um, Nylon, pretty amazing performance, kind of like aluminum. You really need to figure out how to reduce the footprint if you want to use it in your building. Um, so both for, for aluminum or for steel and for nylon, the answer is to find recycled content. You want all that performance without the footprint. We got to find waste nylon, waste aluminum, waste steel that we already have in the system and use that rather than having to go back to those really energy intensive refining um, uh, processes to go from the raw materials to the finished nylon, steel, aluminum. So there are solutions to all of these things, um, but the de facto, you know, your average concrete, your average steel, your average carpet is not necessarily going to have, you know, implemented those solutions. So this is the, the opportunity we have, obviously, you have seen some kind of figures like we're going to build 2 trillion square feet of new rebuilt buildings in the next 35 years. That's the equivalent of a new New York City every 35 days for 35 years. Um, so we have this huge opportunity when it comes to embodied carbon, especially between now and 2030. And so that's why we created this group I mentioned before, the Materials Carbon Action Network, which is really, it's now part of Building Transparency, the NGO based in Seattle. Uh, but it is really a movement to get people to keep score on embodied carbon and to take advantage of this really amazing opportunity we have. Um, Lots of members, but here, let me see if I can play this video. There we go. Interface is on a new mission called Climate Take Back, which is our promise to run our business in a way that reverses global warming. We decided to work with some industry partners to help educate, raise awareness, and create case studies around prioritizing embodied carbon in materials specifications for the built environment. The embodied carbon of materials and what they emit during manufacture and transport and actual construction is actually more than the operational carbon of those buildings operated to 2030 or 2050. And as contractors, we're the ones that really have the responsibility and control over procurement of materials uh, and driving that number down. 
Materials Can is really about, first of all, awareness and being able to help the industry understand what embodied carbon is, and then also being able to share the tools and support those tools that are being created by the network that will be open source and available for everyone to use. We're not going to be a product or a building certification. We really want to lend our big names to building up the understanding of embodied carbon. So there's a lot of environmental impact categories and it's difficult for folks to understand. And coming up with Materials Cam, that really has been an opportunity to simplify the message that we have to the architects, to the design community. Materials are very complicated for designers with as much as they need to do in the time frame they've got. Often asking the question of how materials are made and what their impact is is the last thing on their radar. At some point our buildings need to be not only carbon positive in terms of operation, but also create an opportunity so that we can recapture what we've done over the last 100 years as a human species to our built environment. It's been sort of a long time coming that we have interest from the market in specifying products that have lower embodied carbon. I love it that we have other manufacturers that are interested as well and are starting to see that connection between lower embodied carbon and products and how sort of facilities are run. I'm very excited to see this grow even further. I think it's good for all of us. There's a great opportunity here in the, in the architecture and design community to understand embodied carbon and act on it. And so uh, Materials Can is that tip of the spear to hopefully engage everyone and to show them you know, what we can do and, and hopefully have them participate. I think Materials Can has a lot of potential. Uh, first, to have leading organizations actually step up and say embodied carbon is important, but the fact that then we can then bring others into the fold and create an industry movement towards action versus just companies leading the way, I think is, is where things are going with Materials Can. We want to start with manufacturers being transparent about the carbon footprint of their products, and then designers and owners and contractors really using that information so that we can actually make buildings part of the solution instead of just less of the problem. So that was a kickoff video, and that really is still the work of Materials Can. We've added a bunch of new members since then. We just actually added a our first concrete manufacturer uh, for member, which is Heidelord Materials, also known as Lehigh Hansen. We just did a rebrand, but they are creating, and I think that's pretty exciting, the first uh, carbon negative cement plant in Alberta. Uh, now we need to figure out how to scale up that technology to have it be a more than one facility. Um, but really, people are taking some strides to not just you know in the direction even for, for difficult materials like concrete and cement in the direction of carbon negativity uh, the other exciting thing that came out of materials can is that the owners started to get excited about it owners and developers um, daniels a multifamily developer in in canada became a big champion of this we also the u.s federal government in the form of the general services administration but lots of other brands you will have heard of joined this and said, well, we don't really want to hang out with the manufacturers and materials. Can we want to have our own group? Um, so that's the, the Owners Carbon Action Network. And they're, of course, creating standards for design firms and others that work for them to say, if you work for us on a project a development or a TI or whatever, you need to consider embodied carbon and use the tools available to reduce embodied carbon. So as it says, our, the work is to drive awareness, share methodology. No one's really been doing this work. So we need to say, how are you doing it? <laughs> uh, take action, do those case studies, and then get more and more people in the game as we expand the partnership to keep score on body carbon. So we've established that this work is very important and timely to do. How do we do it? <laughs> Good news is that if you've looked around you, there's no shortage of data. We have all these environmental product declarations for different categories. We've been collecting them to get a point and lead. Um, but in those complicated you know, documents, we have all of this, this wonderful data, um, which is kind of similar to a nutrition facts label. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're kind of trying to put our buildings on a carbon diet. So we got to know what we're looking for in a nutrition facts label. These are you know, kind of dense documents like on the side of your cereal box. So if we're going for our low carb, or in this case, low carbon diet, uh, we need to know where in that document you find the, the contribution of climate change. It could be called global warming potential, it could be called carbon footprint. In the EPD, it's usually called GWP, global warming potential. Um, and what's the number per unit um, for this particular brand of this product that you're looking at? 
Now, ideally, we would get to the point where we read all the EPDs and we put together a nice chart like this, and we say, okay, well, this is you know carpet tile made in North America. What's the footprint? What are my options to get? You know, this is the footprint to make a square meter of carpet tile. Could be as low as you know 2.8 kilos of pollution to make that square meter, or it could be as high as 20.7 kilos to make that that product. You get to choose. Um, so this is the kind of the power of that EPD data if we figure out how to use it and compare it. And of course, what that will enable us to do across many product categories, not just just carpet tile, is to say, okay, here's my number. I know here's the range for carpet tile. I, I don't really think I should be able to just use something that's on the left side of this graph. So let's say I'm gonna rule out anything that's over 13. You know, that rules out half of these products immediately, but we still have plenty of options. But you can do the same thing for wallboard, ceiling tile, for insulation. Establish your per unit number based on EPD data. Now, the trick is that that would require reading EPDs, which I read 20 some odd EPDs to make this chart. You shouldn't have to do that. Nobody that you like should have to read EPDs unless they're just a super awesome nerd and they love that kind of stuff. So how do we scale up the ability to get to this point where we know the number we don't have to accept for every category? This is where we get into the development of the EC3 tool. Because you've got, you know, in the work, and I'm sure none of you have worked with whole building LCA tools like Tally, One Click, Athena, that's the first work we need to do. Can we reuse part of the building? What are our major structural systems? What are our big sort of planning level, early stage design decisions that can reduce embodied carbon? Maybe we can, you know, use some additional timber construction. Uh, these kind of big decisions that we can model out at the level of, of the plan. Now, once we've decided what the general design is and use some of this whole building LCA uh, methodology, then we actually have to buy stuff. Then we actually figure out, okay, so to build out my design, I need a bunch of materials. I can't just completely reuse the old building. Um, how do I find better lower embodied carbon product for the materials I do need to buy new. That's been the gap currently. Now, but if we do this work, if we do the design work and we do you know, the procurement work, it's a huge potential win cumulatively to reduce embodied carbon. So how do we fill this gap? So embodied carbon reduction, we'd all like to have a tool that reads the EPDs for us that leverages this data that's out there. Uh, we'd like it to be available to everyone, easy to use, free to use, open and transparent about where the data is coming from, open API, which means whatever data we have can be transferred to other tools that's not just locked up in one proprietary database. And then this is probably the most important focused on supply chain accountability. This is how that data actually drives change. If you look at this data and say, wow, that's a really high carbon footprint for this product, I'm not buying it. Suddenly, the if that message gets back to the manufacturer, they have to say, wow, we can't sell to these customers because they care about embodied carbon uh, and our number's too high. Now we have accountability. Now we need to go back and change something in the supply chain. Now we need to emit less into the atmosphere. And that is the whole point of this exercise. So the EC3 tool is, of course, what has come out of, came out of this, this wish list. Uh, the companies at the bottom there were very involved in the early stage getting this going, including CLF including clean BC as well. And so now we have all kinds of partners. Once people realize what this could unlock in terms of you know, a contribution to the full picture of climate change, if you think about how much of human climate changing emissions come from the building industry, a tool that could help us quickly and easily reduce embodied carbon on every project where we buy building materials could be a game changer. Uh, so now we have a lot of people on board. So I'm gonna take a minute to at least show you the basics of the tool. I'm happy to have questions if you have them, um, but I do wanna show you the tool because um, there's nothing I can talk to you about it and show you screen shares of it, but uh, better if we actually just look at the tool. All right, so. Open to Zoom, so we're not on. All right, so this is the EC3 tool. I logged in already, but it's it's free. You will have to create a login if you've never used it before. Hopefully some of you have, have played with EC3 or maybe even used it on a project. The two main functions of EC3 are to find and compare materials. That's trying to figure out, do we have a lower carbon option that meets my spec in other ways? And then plan and compare buildings. Once I've put in my lower carbon options, 
what cumulatively has it done to reduce the embodied carbon of my building? Maybe I can even compare it to someone else who's put their data in the system. Let's look at what find and compare materials looks like. Um, again, consider your guide here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look at carpet. Carpet has a lot of EPDs in it. Not all these these categories are as well built out, but you can see that it includes a lot of the heavy hitters and the body carbon from the structural side, concrete, masonry, steel, aluminum, um, down to stuff you find inside like chips and boards, ceiling panels, flooring, uh, starting to have paint and coatings. Uh, that category is being built out right now. But let's look at carpeting, because who doesn't want to look at carpeting? Um, just to show you what the data looks like, let's say we're, we want carpet tile uh, rather than broad bloom. Uh, we will narrow our, our range a little to make sure it's just North America, stuff that we can actually buy here. Uh, you can put in other stuff like yarn material, pile weight, you can, you can do this. The data sort is not perfect on that. Again, work in progress. This button down here, I always recommend you use because they're very responsive to user needs. It says a, a mission-driven NGO building transparency who runs this tool. And if the tool is not user-friendly, if you don't wanna use it, they are not gonna be successful in their mission to reduce global warming emissions. Um, so please, you can click on this little button, tell them what problem you have, tell them if something is not intuitive, tell them if something is not working or seems inaccurate. Um, that's one of the biggest things you can do to support EC3 as a user. So let's run the search here, carpet tile in North America, see what our, our options are. So the first thing you're gonna see when the search concludes, you're gonna see this little bar chart at the side here. This is kind of a bell curve on its side. That's the top of that is the 80th percentile. That's gonna be the higher side of, of where most of the products are. The bottom of that little uh, rectangle is going to be the 20th percentile. That's gonna be the lower side of the middle of the bell curve. Um, so most of our data, most of our products are going to be found in there and it's between eight and four kilos per square meter of flooring. You can go and change your units up here if you need square feet or something, um, but it's set right now on standard international metric units. So now we scroll down and we can see what some of the data looks like here. You can see an important part here, product EPDs, this has 380 EPDs, so it actually has a pretty robust set of products, unlike some other ones where um, there are less products available. So if you go into a category, you find that there's only nine EPDs, I'd take the data a little less seriously. But so we can look in here and the default sort here is gonna be whoever has downloaded their EPDs most recently. And so you can see Bentley has updated their EPDs pretty recently. So they're gonna be first here. They're also the first al alphabetically. A more useful sort is to press this little button here and sort it kind of like you can on an Excel spreadsheet from lowest to highest. So as indicated by the Jeopardy question, the lowest are some handful of interface products that are actually carbon negative carbon tile. Um, so that's gonna be the lowest. And then you can just kind of scroll down, you'll see that um, you actually have to hunt through. Interface has the most EPDs and lowest footprint. So it takes a while to get out of interface territory. If you're in a situation where you need to have a competitive bid, we're going to need to scroll all the way on up uh, close to five before you're going to, going to find a competitor. Uh, once we get up close to five, uh, you can have two competitors. You've got, you've got a Shaw, a Shaw Packraft product um, at 4.9. If we need additional options, we're going to keep scrolling. We need to have at least three, which is required for some government jobs. But this allows you then to go in and say, Oh, wow. So I can get three vendors if I set my number at, say, eight. Well, I go higher than that. And then in EC3, you can actually go up here and put the number you've decided you don't need to go over in here and then say, actually, just show me the stuff that's eight or below. And then you'll get a similar kind of Excel spreadsheet style, style data set at the bottom, um, but it won't show you any of the stuff that is over eight. You'll just see the options. The lower face weight products, products with a bit more recycled, you know, plastic in them. Um, so that is the basics of, of product searches. Obviously, these performance specifications are very important. If you go into something like concrete, um, you're going to see PSI and all of the other performance specs. Because what you need, if you're looking for a low carbon version, 
of the product that works in your project, not just a low carbon version of generally in that category. If it's the wrong kind of concrete, obviously you're not gonna use it just because it's low carbon, similarly for flooring or ceiling tile, or there's all these other performance characteristics, acoustics, et cetera, you have to consider as well. Um, all right, seems like we're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Just looking at the uh, so the screen share is not working at all. Let's move on to any questions people have. I'm going to just put up the slides again, but it's most important if people have areas they particularly wanted to dig in on. We'll just say that if you're looking to compare. Projects, of course, once you've picked your specific products and you know found lower carbon options, you can roll them up into a whole product as shown in this slide. 59% reduction um, versus either the CLF baseline or you can say versus if we would have chosen 80th percentile and everything conservative. Um, but what do we have in terms of questions other than technical questions about why the screen share isn't working, which I don't know that there's much I can do about that. We see your screen share now. The other thing, I want to, other tool I want to make sure you know about um, as you're thinking about questions, Carbon Smart Materials Palette from Architecture 2030, if you are not ready to dig into EC3 and EPD data and do the quantitative analysis here, you can still write spec language into a specification to get you generally in the direction of embodied carbon. If you know what drives the embodied carbon of each product category, and that's what this tool does. It tells you, okay, for concrete, look for this, use this specification language for steel, where you're looking for electric arc furnaces versus basic oxygen furnaces, stuff you can put in a spec. For carpet, you're looking for high recycled content nylon. So that's what drives the footprint of a carpet tile. So you can say, you could either put a number from EC3 and it says, you know, nothing above eight, eight kilos per meter squared, or you could do it qualitatively and say, I've got to have at least 50% um, recycled content in nylon yarn. Uh, either way, we're just looking for you to have an option of some action to take. Because ultimately we need to move the market. We need to move the market, get this scoring into lead, get it into building code, get all the other challenge, all of the other standards we're using. Uh, I do think it's exciting. The government is starting to actually take action on. There's our lead pilot credit that we got approved. If you do an uh, EC3 type analysis, you can get credit in lead and the, this pilot credit. Starting to see this pop up in policy. I should have a map for Canada as well because we're starting to see some provincial and federal movement in Canada. We now have a, a federal uh, regulation around concrete in particular. Um, but you have specific states now that, and even counties. You know, this is one in, in my area where we're required to use low carbon concrete in the county of Marin, north of San Francisco. California has four product categories where for state government projects are required to have to be below a per unit embodied carbon number. Uh, and of course, as I said, you can now roll this up. If we find reductions in all these categories, we get to these product level reductions, which you can actually brag about to your customers. And of course, this project required no additional, um, no additional uh, money to be spent. And we now know from this RMI study that that is true across a broad range of commercial building projects where 46 to 24% of body carbon reduction, less than 1% cost premium. It's not required in order to do this work. We just need to go look for the better products. And things like EC3, of course, can help you do that more efficiently. I'm just trying to see if there's a question here. Does EC3 look at the material? Any more questions? Look at the materials that create um, EPROM spoilers. MEP systems are not um, in EC3 yet, but obviously the most important thing for an MEP system is its in-use efficiency with how efficiently it's using energy. 
but we are starting to see some work done to quantify, obviously making the metal and whatever other things we had to use to make the MEP system. Um, there's some embodied carbon there as well. Um, they're not live in AC3 yet. Uh, we have a few stalwarts like TK Elevator that are doing a body carbon analysis for MEP systems, but it's still hard to find data on that. Um, resources, PDF summary docs, we can send to manufacturers, try to get them involved in that climate action network here about. Yes, um, look at materialscan.org for available documents. We will be posting the manufacturer's guide imminently, I think in the next couple of weeks. Um, that's kind of trying to get manufacturers that aren't in the game yet familiar with the terms and looking at, you know, if you're just basic energy efficiency, you know, whatever the moves are, here's how to get your first EPD. You've never done LCA before. Here's what you need to, to do to get started. EC3 reports A1 to A3. Not sure if EPD includes impacts for other life cycle stages. Um, The most comparable impacts are those A1 to A2. So you will seldom see it because once you get past that into the use phase, it's all based on assumed data. It's not like facility energy use or something. It's like, okay, well, if we assume you're transporting it, you know, in four, that's to transport to market. We assume that it's 500 miles on average. And so what you're gonna see in an EPD is the data for transporting on a 500 miles. Um, it's not, the data to transport it to your job site. Similarly, for maintenance, we have an assumed maintenance protocol and an assumed cleanliness of the electrical grid. For instance, if you're running the vacuum on, the vacuum your carpet, it's all assumptions. And so that's why we really tried to focus on that A1 to A3, where you can get some real data of how much energy does it take to produce nylon or cement. Um, uh, but yes, those other things are important. For instance, if your product was substantially easier to maintain, um, you know, required less energy to maintain, less emissions to maintain, that would be important in your kind of A or your, uh, your B categories, which are the use space, not A1 to A3, but B is the next one. I don't know if that answered the question there. Sounds like we need to wrap up. But there's my email address. If you do have follow-up questions, I am available to you. It is my job at Interface to help catalyze this transformation in the marketplace. So let me know what I can help you wherever you're at in this process, wherever you're at in this ecosystem. If you want to make a difference, anything I can help, let me know.